Hello, everybody. Um, nice to meet you here on this webinar about future now, earthen, revisiting earthen architecture. I would like to do a short introduction about inside architecture and the project future now. So inside architecture aims to convey knowledge and foster appreciation for contemporary and modern architecture in Latin America with a focus on Brazil. We offer tours, architecture tours, workshops, we do conduct conferences, events, and create exhibitions for a local and also for a global audience. A project we were developing for almost two years that comes now to fruition is called the Future Now Pavilion. It is an exhibition that is the official Swiss contribution to the 27th World Congress of Architects, the UIA 2021 in Rio de Janeiro. From September 8, two days ago, to October 17th at Praça Mauá, the Mauá Square in the center of Rio de Janeiro, between the two museums, uh, the Museum of Tomorrow and the Museum of Art of Rio, there is a new architectural experience with the open air exhibition, Future Now, Revisiting Earthen Architecture. The project is one of the few physical exhibitions that is part of the UIA Congress of Architects. The initiative is executed in collaboration with the architects Pedro, Pedro Rivera from Brazil and Diego Bailoyan from Chile. And in collaboration with the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH Zurich, and the support of from Royal Lezia and the Swiss the Swiss General Consulate in Rio de Janeiro. This public exhibition is about innovation within the construction techniques of rammed earth, so-called bise or taipa in Portuguese, and digital fabrication with clay. The pavilion as a pure wood construction is designed by the Chilean architect Diego Balayan and his team in collaboration with ITA, a Brazilian construction company specialized in sustainable wood. The exhibition is curated by Inside Architecture and its content realized in partnership with the ETH Zurich by the architects Fabio Gramasio of Gramasio Kohler Research and Roger Bolzhauser of Studio Bolzhauser who will be our guests speakers today. So why this exhibition? Clay is one of the oldest known building materials and is available in large quantities all over the world. In the course of history, technological development has steadily reduced its significance, first by introducing fire clay and later by cement and concrete. The widespread use of this very performative and allegedly eternal material was enabled by the almost limitless availability of cheap coal and oil-based energy throughout the 20, 20th century. Now, climate change and the threat it poses to civilization is forcing us to reduce the amount of embodied energy in building materials, and thus to radically rethink the way we build our environment. It is from this perspective that Future Now intends to revisit the potential of unfired clay as a fully reusable, carbon neutral building material, which has the added advantage of not needing transportation as it can be sourced locally almost worldwide. Studio Boltzhauser and Gramatio Kohler research of the ETH have investigated the potential of clay constructions for more 
for a more sustainable future. Displayed at the exhibition alongside highlights of the rich cultural history of earthen architecture are two prototype projects that were developed together with students and young researchers. We must recognize that nothing is for eternity and that the built environment needs constant maintenance and transformation. This simple finding makes it imperative to build more and more with zero waste and carbon neutral materials and to look for a radically contemporary architectural expression as well. So the shown works of Fabio and Roger at the exhibition could contribute to writing a new chapter in the rich history of earthen construction that will carry us into the future. So future now, futuro agora. Um, now I would like to pass on to Leonardo from Swiss Next for a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And on behalf of Swiss Next in Brazil, I want to congratulate you for the initiative. We've been partners in this in this journey uh, since the since 2019, when you first uh, presented us the the concept of and, and the idea of this project, uh, an amazing idea. And we are on board since the beginning. Uh, with the mission of, uh, as we do, bring together Brazil and Switzerland uh, in, in discussions and reflections uh, in the field of education, research, and innovation, and of course, in the specific field of architecture. And we've been uh, engaged in many activities, many discussions um, for the last two years about architecture, about uh, urbanism, about mobility, about the future of our cities, about the future uh, of our lives uh, in big cities, about health implications, about sustainability. And this is uh, another great opportunity for, uh, for us to, to bring together those uh, great minds and, and, and thought leaders in the field. And we are very happy to support and to be part of this uh, to journey, this initiative. Uh, we were very happy to, I speak personally uh, about this experience this week. It was, I think, the first event that was able to, 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 to be uh, and to join and to visit physically. So I think it's a great opportunity if our participants, the participants here are in Rio or have the opportunity to be in Rio. So I recommend that. Uh, they can visit the place. And thanks, Fabio Gramatio, Pedro Rivera, and Roger Boltzhauser for uh, your participation, your engagement in your time in this initiative. And I wish a very good discussion and dialogue for everyone. Thanks, Jason. Uh, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Leonardo. Let me quickly introduce uh, Pedro Rivera before passing on the panel. So Pedro is an architect and urbanist whose work flows between design, research with focus on the relations among, between architecture, art, and urban inequality. So he's a co-founder of Rua Architetus in Rio de Janeiro and assistant professor of the GSAFPP of Columbia, Columbia University in New York. So Pedro, it's thank you, you Jason. Uh, hi, everyone. Also, thank you, Roger. Thank Fabio. I also want to thank Diego, which was our partner along this trip. Well, this project has been going on for three years now, since before the pandemic. And much has changed in, in the meantime, in the project, in the Congress of Architects, but also in our cities. We face gigantic challenges uh, after COVID to rethink how we live, the spaces that we live. And therefore, I think this is a great opportunity. Why not to think this also through the material perspective? So I will give a, a brief introduction on Roger and Fabio. And then Roger first will make his presentation and uh, Fabio right after. So Roger Bothauser, uh, after his graduation from the ETH Zurich, Roger Bothauser founded his office 
Pothauser Architect and AG in 1996 in Zurich. In addition to his practice, he was, he was a research assistant at the Institute for the History and Theory of Architecture, GTA, from 1996 to 1998, and a teaching assistant at the chair of Peter Merkley at ETA Zurich and EPFL Lausanne from 1997 to 1999. Between 2004 and 2010, he was engaged as a lecturer for design at the University of Applied Sciences, SURE, HTW, and between 25 and 29 at the master degree course at Anhalt University of Applied Sciences and SURE Institute of Architecture. From 2016 and 2017, he was a guest professor as APFL Lausanne, and from 2017 and 2018 at TU Munich. Since 2018, he's a guest professor at ETH Zurich. I also start introducing Fab Gramatio now. He's an architect with multidisciplinary interests, interests ranging from computational design and robotic fabrication to material innovation. In, in uh, 2000, he founded the architecture practice Gramatio and Kohler in conjunction with his partner, Matthias Kohler, where numerous award-winning designs have been realized. Current, pro current projects include the design of the EMPANEST research platform, a future living and working laboratory for sustainable building construction, opening also the world's first architectural robotic laboratory at the ETH Zurich, Gramatio and Keller research has been formative in the field of digital architecture, setting a precedence and de facto creating a new research field, merging advanced architecture design and additive fabrication processes through the customization, customized use of industrial robots. This ranges from one-to-one -one prototype installations to design of robotically fabricated high rises. His recent research is outlined and theoretically framed in the book, The Robotic Touch, How Robots, Robots Change Architecture, Part Books 2014. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, Fabio Gramasio was director of studies for bachelor and master architecture. So uh, welcome and please, Roger Bothauser will start doing his presentation. So hello everybody, um, thank you very much for the invitation. I will go uh, short to my presentation. Um, yes, yes, okay, now it works. So uh, I like to talk about our project which we show uh, in Rio. It's, uh, uh, it's a pavilion we built, but the pavilion has a history and, the, and this history starts at the APFL. Uh, which we did an exhibition and some student work about PC, uh, rammed earth construction, and where we talk about tradition and potential. And the, the idea for this book and for this exhibition was um, based on the first house I did in, in rammed earth. It was the house Rauch and the Seal Hölzli. And this was 10 years ago already. And uh, many people liked this project but there was also some critical votes. One was the, to build with the earth is something which you only can do in a small scale. And the second point was, yeah, it's a very nice building, but it, but it has nothing to do with our culture. So we thought it's maybe nice to start with some research at EPFL about the culture in earth in, our, uh, in Europe and also talk about the potential from earth construction. Can we go in a bigger scale? So the research we did, we did in Fra France and also in, in Switzerland, and we found many rammed earth buildings in the region of Lyon, which are 200 years old and older in uh, very well condition and also very interesting typology. Here we have a former building and also a huge building, which uh, is also a former building here, which they did 200 years ago in earth with rammed earth and it's our chromosome it's not covered and, and beautiful building. So 
And we also found some uh, uh, images, uh, some, some projects and buildings in Switzerland. So it's a, it's a culture which is forgotten uh, and people don't know that anymore, but you have a culture in Earth and it's also the good thing uh, to go on with that because we have a lot of material uh, in our regions which we can use and, and make building out of that. So we go to the second point with our students, we start to think about, can you build in a bigger scale? Because the other critique, as you hear, was that it's not able to do bigger structure. And so we've developed with our students ideas for bigger structure, to build faster, to build higher, to have uh, answer to the earthquake case. And the students start to build uh, new mock-ups, also in combination with other material, and develop skyscrapers. Here, a cultural tower in Lausanne. Uh, they uh, develop slabs uh, pre with pretension cables, to which you can stand on it. And they also uh, developed a pavillon, which was a kind of mock-up, which we had the idea to do uh, um, a mock-up, which we test the idea of pretension, not in a horizontal way, more in a vertical way, because earth construction has no metal in it. So the earthquake case, the stability of the building with this material is, is a problem. So we, if we want to go really higher and build denser with this material, looking to the future with this material, we have to find answer. And one idea was this pretension idea. And you see the cable uh, in this picture, in this mock-up in between uh, these gaps, uh, which we put on the pressure. We measure that if this really works. And because it was not clear if earth will shrink and then the pretension doesn't work anymore, but it works after six months. And so we was, uh, yeah, but this mock-up was the first mock-up mock which works together with earth and on the tension, uh, they also work uh, for a bigger structure. So we go on, I went to the uh, Theo Munich, but I want just to have two schemas I want to show you why uh, the energy we need for building is more and more important. Uh, just a simple diagram. One is mobility. This is always where the building is, how important mobility is. Mobility is or mobility or 25% if you build in a city. 19% is more the, uh, the energy you need to, to keep the building going. But more and more important is the, the energy you need to build something. And this is this 56%. And there uh, we should start to think about how we can go in the future. And here, which uh, it's really that earth counts a lot. And in Switzerland, it's uh, maybe a little bit complex and it's in German, but it just say in Zurich, there is that amount of building material come into Zurich as we also bring out earth material. So if you bring that in a, uh, together, if you build with earth, you can reduce the, the building material enormous. And we think you can, uh, beside concrete, uh, I think in the future, it's probably with using earth, we can reduce that to minimum 50%. And this is a, a big impact. So the Theo Munich, we start uh, to develop tower structure. We want really going to go higher and to a real building. Uh, we, we choose uh, at the end, not the biggest one, but it's around nine meter. And we go with this pretension idea. Again, we also build an oven and a platform to have a nice look from the region. We build the building in earth, completely with earth blocks. We put them with tension cable together. And it's a completely circular building, which we did. We did uh, the, the new construction together with wood. The, the wood are uh, the, the beams to put the cable on, to, to put them on tension. And we built this uh, building with our students from all the schools I was, TEU, APFL, and the ETH. This is the first element the student produce. We bring that to the side, we build it together, and we bring the cable into the construction. And uh, yeah, you see now beautiful details of this building, the inside space, which is also a little museum for brick construction, burnt and unburnt uh, construction. You see also an adobe wall, an unburnt wall with adobe uh, uh, pieces. And here you see a nice section of this building. And at the end, uh, you see the chimney with adobe uh, uh, bricks and here the, the, the ending. If you come to the, uh, the roof, you have a beautiful view. 
a staircase. Yes, so this is my presentation. Uh, and this is our project we show and uh, it really works and it's uh, and with this system we are able to really go uh, in a higher dimension and maybe also build skyscrapers and so this is the other the second point that as we believe it's possible to build with earth material bigger structure now i have a little movie i try to go out and show you this movie uh, again so i go to this movie quickly and this is just a movie about the production uh yeah now so and i hope it works Roger, Roger, we can see the movie. You can't see? You forgot oh. to share, probably. Okay. Use the bottom at the bottom, share screen, the green okay, one. Okay, sorry. Uh, can you see it? Can you see my yes. screen? Okay, sorry for that. Uh, so, you, can you see it? Yes. Great. Let's start again. Sorry for that. So, can you hear me too? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So, I just, uh, maybe we, we have some words. Uh, you see the production and the mixing uh, of earth and uh, you see how they produce the first element. Maybe I don't talk that much. I think the pictures are strong enough. The material. Material come the earth come into the framework. The framework is near. It's it's nearly the same you use normally for concrete. So it's uh, but it's a little bit stronger because the compression needs strong um, uh, frameworks. So the earth blocks, they always remember me to Swiss chocolate because they're very brown if they take them out of the framework. But then you have to let them dry around eight weeks and then you're, it's put down. on the building side to prefabricate the element uh, helps to, to save a lot of time so it, this is also um, uh, very efficient to build faster on the building side so yeah you assemble them and build them together and of course this is also a way of building uh, faster and also higher, which in a traditional technique doesn't work if you build all everything by the side.
tower is around nine meter high. So it's around, it's three meters higher than the mock-up we did before at the CITOVAC together with the EPFL students. Most of the workers are architects, <laughs> which helps to build that also. And engineers, Felix Hilgert is one of them. This is the wood structure was also uh, important for the tension. So the wood beams bring the force to the earth element and with the cable, we take the whole construction down, pre-tension the whole structure. This is the end of the cable and the instrument to put them on the pressure. And we control that now every week to do also to have new more information about what's happened if we put this construction on the pretension. Yeah, this is retouching. This is, uh, yeah, we fill up all the holes and make it uh, beautiful. Also, these wood uh, elements helps to, to uh, save the earth construction. This is kind of uh, water dropping uh, elements so that the, the water is not washed out the earth construction. This is, in a way, the same material. And this is the finished pavio. And the door also work with tension. This is a little bit uh, an architectonical element. Here is the oven. And it's also the idea to show the whole process to from burn, unburned material to a burnt material and what you can do with clay because the, the context is a brick museum, the oldest brick museum in Switzerland. It's in two in calm. So this is it. Thank you very much. So sorry for the break I did. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roger. And now please, yeah, I, uh, I, I share screen. my screen and, and go for my presentation. Just a second. Here we go. Share. Okay, I, I hope that you see the, the, the slide. So after this very nice presentation and movie by Roger, uh, I'd like to show our approach, uh, the approach of our professorship to the, to the same material. Uh, the material has already been introduced. Uh, Jason at the very beginning explained why this material is extremely interesting for the future of architecture. Uh, what 
uh, interested us particularly and uh, this uh, sort of relationship to this material started already 10 years ago when we did the uh, first project with students that I will very shortly show. And uh, the raw material or the way we, we conceive the raw material is shown here. So we have an extrusion and we create cylinders of wet material. And uh, the, the very sp special properties of this material allow to construct with what we call soft, soft, soft bricks, because the material is malleable and can be pressed uh, and formed through force or kinetic energy. Uh, now, I would like very quickly to, to show this predecessor project because it uh, nicely showed the trajectory of, of the thinking. So the idea back then was, of course, it was not put in very realistic, pragmatic terms. It was more of an installation where we tried to, to, to uh, you know, find out about the limits of the materials and the potential. We said, what about shooting clay? Because it's a sticky material. If uh, we can calculate uh, the trajectory, this is uh, ballistics. And uh, on the other hand, if we have uh, sensors uh, that allow us to understand uh, where the material lands when throwing it, uh, and this here is just a scanner, uh, then we can correct uh, its trajectory and make sure that it lands. This is a, a scanner that we mounted to the to the ceiling, uh, actually in the same uh, same place where Roger Roger uh, built his prototype of his uh, of his uh, structure. Very nice place in San Callen. see that by throwing this material you end up having this result and this is an extremely beautiful uh, configuration of material that uh, on one hand uh, uh, really you know starts to inter interlock in uh, in unforeseen ways in ways that you would never model or build by hand and it creates uh, something that is uh, partially out of control, but still, if you look at these things, is able to grow vertically. Uh, so uh, this project was uh, done 10 years ago, and then the, the whole thing rested for a while until uh, we had the, the chance, partially, partially it was started through uh, the, the, the Rio, the planned Rio installation, and then we had because of COVID to revert to another project, we had the chance to build a real piece of architecture at the, at the real scale with it. And what you see here is uh, the, 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 the outset dilemma. So if you wanted to go up to five meter with this technique of just uh, stacking together soft, soft bricks, because this is not pretensioned uh, in the same in the way Roger showed it, then uh, you would have to be one meter twenty-five uh, uh, thick at the base. What means to uh, use a lot of material? To use a lot of material in case of clay is not the real problem because the material, as we have seen, is CO two neutral, is uh, available but uh, time you need to configure it with, uh, in our case, a robot, but even manually would be uh, too much time. Uh, so we decided to try to build this five meters with uh, a slenderness of uh, 15 centimeters. The solution, design solution to this has been to undulate the wall See, the project is, uh, is, is a rotunda, a circle, a big cylinder. And by undulating this very paper, very much paper thin uh, uh, aggregation of these soft bricks, we have uh, been able to stabilize it. 
this is the project that has been realized. It's the outer shell of, uh, of uh, uh, Sound Studio. Uh, and here you see the uh, construction process. While uh, this first uh, remote material disposition project was really throwing the material, here we wanted and we needed a much, much higher control on the, on the position and on the deformation of the single uh, soft bricks. So we used a traditional uh, industrial robot that would be uh, able in a certain uh, reach to stack these parts. Because the reach of the robot is limited, of course, we had to subdivide the whole structure into uh, modules or sections uh, that you see here. That again interlocked interlock uh, to each other like macro elements or macro brick that again stabilize each other. Here you see uh, the, the, the bond. Now I would like, <clears throat> sorry for this, to quickly show the making of, again, the movie. Let me share, there we go, this one. I think I have to optimize. That's good. So here you see this machine. Here you see again, this is a very important element. Uh, a scanner, so a measuring device that allows uh, give feedback to the machine. The machine is not absolutely precise and the material uh, is neither. So adapt uh, the position uh, of uh, construction so to adapt the next step uh, result of the last one here, uh, here where things are pretty much under control this ends up to be a, a, a pretty fast process if you're able to be that thin because uh, you're basically uh, working with uh, very, very little material that stays in place because of the geometry, the overall geometry of the, of the big shape. Here you see nicely again how this sort of in an equilibrium between precision and unprecision, between uh, the laws of the material that are also, you know, very, very uh, demanding because uh, being uh, uh, clay, not a hydraulic material, so it doesn't have a binder like uh, cement, but it just dries just loses humidity or water, it also means that it, it shrinks. By shrinking, it creates, let me go back to the presentation here, this, this image, you know, by shrinking, it creates crack. And the cracks is something that you have to live with. Uh, and you, the nice thing of the, 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 this material is that you can repair everything. You can just model, insert fresh clay and fill up whatever cracks you get. And this uh, nicely illustrates how this material in whatever, I think, whatever uh, technique you use to, to build it, to, to, to uh, stack it or to ram it and so on, has, uh, you know, needs maintenance, needs, needs care. It's the opposite than uh, the supposedly eternal materials that in fact are not, uh, you know, we found out after 100 years, like concrete, uh, clay is something that you have to uh, continuously uh, 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 repair. What is, I think, a very, a very interesting thought, also because architecture is something that is not eternal and in continuous.
continuous movement and reconfiguration. This was my short presentation. I give back, I don't know, to who? To Pedro, probably. To me. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Fabio. Yeah. Uh, I think these this were two incredible presentations that definitely push uh, the limits of the profession and impel, propel us to think beyond, let's say, the, the limits that we normally think of architecture and think of the, let's say, the technological uh, boundaries of, of architecture. Normally, we are trained to operate within a certain perimeter uh, of knowledge, and, and, and it's always very, uh, uh, very, it's very, it's very, it's great to see how can we achieve new, uh, new designs, uh, new possibilities uh, for architecture. The, the first comment that, that I wanted to, to make is, is actually was a little bit the end of, uh, of the presentation of Fabio, which is this idea of, of uh, the life cycle, cycle idea of, of construction. Right. Uh, I remember my first, I mean, Brazil has, has some uh, Remedov architecture. We, we do have some uh, spread out through the country uh, examples, but, but the first time I got, I got impressed, impressed by that was visiting Morocco, Morocco. And it was, uh, it was a kind of a, a, a weird sensation to see Many villages, like really many, many villages that were uh, in, in one way falling apart because people were substituting the, 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 the technology by concrete. People were, were leaving to build with earth in, in, in favor of concrete. But at the same time, uh, a little bit uh, recomfortable, recomfortable, I mean, uh, to know that these, let's say, these uh, abandoned buildings would return to its natural, uh, 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 through its natural condition, right? So basically, in the in the last century, along the the 20th century, what what we saw was like a huge effort to to make things permanent, to make things uh, lasting forever, and probably to make things last much longer than, the, than actually we need, uh, uh, we need them to, to ask. And one detail that uh, it's very, it was very uh, interesting in, in the very end of the presentation was the act of fixing, the act of permanently engaging with the building. So if, if we think, uh, uh, let's say the, the 20, 20, 21st, the 20th century architecture, modernism, still a uh, concrete as something permanent, something which is eternal. And uh, there is this, this, uh, this ambiguity that you expect not to touch these buildings never more, but with the urban architecture, you are actually in a permanent, in an eternal act of, in, in, of engaging with the act of beauty. Right, you you are always uh, coming back to architecture and, and and making little repairs and keeping it, let's say, alive. I mean, and, and the, the figure that the, the clay breathes, I think it's a beautiful figure here, and and the fact that we continue to have to engage with it, uh, I, I think corresponds to that idea that a building that, uh, in in many sense, is uh, is is alive, like is is like a uh, uh, a living entity. So, what what I would like perhaps Roger now to to contribute a little bit is is I mean, how how do you engage with this idea of the of the lifespan of the of the of the lifespan of the building of uh, how you, you mentioned that you you are going through a series of tests of the kiln tower. I, I don't know. I mean, for how many years is the tower there? So how do you engage with this idea of a, 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 of a, of a building that needs uh, uh, 
it's a different kind of engagement than you, you were also trained <laughs> in your in your in your when we were trained as an artist, probably the way you were trained in a very different way than it have to work now. Yes. Um, it's like that, but and on the other hand, other hand, if you look, think about wood construction, it's still clear that if, if you have a wood building, you have to repair, you have to paint the windows, and the, this is uh, these techniques arrived, and there is in a way common that you have to take care. In earth construction, because it's close to the massive construction, we know concrete, and uh, earth was, uh, you know, if they start to build with concrete, they use the framework of earth construction. So earth is in a, in, is in a line of, uh, of uh, concrete construction. So there you, it's a strange feeling that you have to take care about building. And it's uh, in that they also look fragile, but we found buildings there was in France, in Lyon the region, it was 800 years old. So it's also the question of, of course, how you take care, you can plaster them with chalk or something, and then you really don't have to do anything. And what is an interesting thing, uh, that earth materials get, get stronger and stronger after years. So we found 100 years old uh, 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 remote earth construction, they were so massive that the people who live there, uh, they tell us that this is an old concrete building. And we said, tell them, no, this is a busy building. We see the holes fit from the, it's, it's a busy. And they said, no, we need something, very massive instrument to put a, a window in it. So yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a strange thing in a way that, uh, that, that, that the, the surface comes a little bit down and that we have to deal with that. And uh, we have to find a relation to that, but um, maybe there are ways to, to, to build in earth that we don't have to do that much. Uh, because in Switzerland, the most of the building are plastered. So we don't see the structure. There is not much to do like in normal building. So there are ways to do to, to it in a way better or more proper. Uh, on the other hand, we like to see the, the structure and because it's beautiful. So it's maybe also uh, something which architecture like to, to show in our climate zone. It's maybe a little bit more sensitive than if you go more to Morocco. And um, Morocco, yeah, we also was there and we found a very old building and it's really if you don't take care about this building um, uh, and, it, and then they go, they erode and they go away, which is in a way beautiful. Also the Chinese wall was partially did, uh, was made in earth and this wall pieces also disappear. So we have to do something for the construction to take care. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they all want to live now in Morocco in modern structure. And they, uh, but uh, and the energy they need to cool the structure down is more than 10% of their salary, which is, which you couldn't believe, you know, besides the earth structure goes away and they, they, they don't need money to, to, to put for energy. And then they go in the concrete structures and they have to turn 10% of salary. So uh, we want to do a project in Morocco too, to, to bring them the earth back in a good way. In a, and maybe it's always just turning the picture, finding new answers to a, a contemporary answer in architecture. And it makes it again, interesting also for the Mar American people. And we found many young architects there, which were very interesting to also to go with new ways. Uh, and, uh, and then it's maybe uh, something um, cool to live uh, <laughs> in an earth building. So I think we have to change things and um, yeah. No, this, this, this is very interesting which you managed to, to, to want to make this, this project to but I, I think, that, uh, I think yes. there is something to exactly the fact that in Morocco they, they long for the modern house. I mean, this is, uh, can be observed everywhere and the same thing that can have, you could observe, uh, I don't know, 50, 60, 100 years ago after World War II. For obvious reason, you know, because you come from a condition that is, uh, you know, uh, bad, you get something better, and this is the promise of modernity. But now we are in a completely different uh, position. Now we have to, uh, you know, climate change is not a joke. 
So it's about mm -hmm. also questioning these uh, assumptions of uh, eternity, of stability, of, you know, why, why shouldn't the building change and show, uh, you know, age? You know, it has always done until, uh, you know, 15 year, 50 years ago, this was normal. And then this illusion of eternity has been implemented by concrete, basically. But it's just an illusion because to repair concrete and concrete, concrete you know, breaks away. No uh, you know, you can do it better or worse, but at some point, you know, if you have infiltration, if you have corrosion, then it's gone. And to repair this, we know it from historic, uh, you know, buildings, or let's say, uh, 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 Build important buildings from 20th century, how expensive and crazy complex technologically it is to, to you know, uh, keep them alive while to repair uh, 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 earth, it's like to paint timber is a pretty, you know, if you don't wait too long and you don't, don't let the damage become, become too big, it's super accessible, you don't, don't need to, uh, uh, expensive material by Sika, you know, you just take earth and, you know, and this I think is, uh, is something that is uh, also should be part of the change to accept that things, uh, you know, degrade and to keep them up as long as this makes sense. Because another thing that is uh, becomes evident now is that, you know, we're building, uh, uh, putting the energy to build buildings that uh, stand for 80, 100 years, but actually there is no stability. You know, programs are unstable, typologies are unstable, you know, one generation and everything is different. You know? So if you're putting so much energy for something that will not last uh, reasonably for, or not perform, you know, in social or architectural terms for the time it was planned and conceived for, then there is a mismatch, you know. And there is also a very interesting aspect, which is uh, uh, this idea of control, uh, uh, of permanent control, of stability, and etc. And it's also a kind of uh, a control of the building processes by industry, right? But by, by large conglomerations that produce cement or you know or produce pipes, etc. And the, the the possibility to build on earth and to develop this technique further is also a, a possibility to, to make it more, uh, more horizontal, uh, to share knowledge, to make uh, knowledge available uh, for more people and probably to have uh, say an, an impact, not in the 10%, but an impact on the, on the 90%, right? Uh, and then there, there is, a, I think there is a, a also a, a big challenge, which, which is my, my, my last question and I will open uh, to, to our guests. Uh, which is uh, when thinking about this conversation, I remember the story of the three little pigs. I think everybody, uh, everybody, Jason didn't know that story, but I mean, that's, I, I know probably most of the people know the, the three, little, three little pigs. The first one made a house out of straw because he didn't want it to work much. The other made a house of uh, sticks, of wood sticks, because he's average. And the third one, who was like a hard worker, made uh, a house of bricks. So this idea of that's the, the one who works hard to build with concrete, probably there was a four P. And, and when telling this story to my daughter, I have a small daughter, I was really thinking, I mean, that there's a cultural problem behind this story because I'm associating the primitive architecture of Brazil, the native architecture of Brazil to something which is unvaluable which we should avoid for something which can last forever and which is what is actually destroying uh, 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 the country, which is destroying the forest, which is, you know, has a huge, uh, a huge impact. So my, my question to both of you is, I mean, how is the, you both mentioned that uh, the, 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 the first construction of Roger was 10 years ago and, and, and Fabio started his research 10 years ago. So you both are engaged uh, with that technique, or not the technique, the material you're developing, the te techniques uh, for 10 years. And how do you see uh, that it's changed, the perception of people has changed in these last 10 years 
uh, in relation to, to, to building uh, with Earth? And what are the challenges that you might face regarding to that? I, uh, I think uh, the, the, this perception or this cultural dimension has uh, gotten an extreme acceleration in the last few years. You know, because the, what we were talking about, the urgency to rethink a few things and become, has become evident you know, beyond the uh, architectural preferences or style or whatever. And uh, still, I think there is a lot of uh, work to be done because there are very deep misconceptions. I was talking about, you know, the resistance uh, or the, you know, the impossibility or the rejection of the, you know, natural aging of architecture. There are crazy stories, you know, in, uh, at least in Switzerland, you know, timber industry is selling pre-grade timber, you know, so take timber, they make it gray and then they sell it because they found out that it's almost impossible for clients to cope with the fact that when the timber is put on the building, it has a different color than a year later, you know, you know, and this is uh, showing how, how crazy deep this, uh, this uh, belief in, uh, you know, stability is. But there, I think uh, the only, you know, there is the political dimension, there is the discursive dimension, but I think the most important one is the, you know, the demonstrator. So the, the fact that Roger built this stuff, you know, started small with the house uh, Rauch, and now it's getting a bit higher, and this needs to go on because it's where people, where the, you know, the, the evidence is, uh, is, uh, is uh, brought that it works and, it, and that it's indeed extremely beautiful, you know. So it's not a theoretical political uh, claim, but it's there, it's real, and it can get bigger and bigger. But it's a slow process, I guess. Yes, uh, it's, I think also, it, it, yeah, the times are, really changing now this in the last I would say the last two three years ex extremely change um, and maybe also COVID uh, was a factor so in, in we now win the first uh, competition in with earth structure so we I just uh, thought how many I was I don't know some friend was asking me why I didn't build earlier more earth building so we start 20 years ago uh, with the seal Hölzli and then we start planning has Rauch and it was finished 2008 and all these points came up which I told you about uh, potential and tradition but uh, we did in this last 20 years around 50 50, 50. 50 uh, competition and we, did, we didn't won one of them with earth so and now we we start to win our competition so we try and try again, and now I think the, it's it's a completely dis different discussion now, especially in Switzerland, that uh, gray energy start to count more and more, and it's more and more important how you build your building. And I think the focus before was more on the energy side, so more the building system which we have to uh, reduce. So there was a strong focus, and you see it also um, uh, in. Uh, in, in documents or in diagrams that this gets better and better, I, I would believe worldwide. Uh, build, uh, we, we use less and less energy for, to, to keep the building going, but now the focus switched to the gray energy. So now uh, I think uh, it's really time to go on with the wood and, and earth and stone. And, and uh, I think yeah, people start to, to look back well, and to check what we did before 200 years ago and, and what is our culture, what is our tradition and try to go on with that and, and also try to find answers in a, in a new, um, in, a, in, in, in the daytime. And I think it's, first of all, pretty, really interesting uh, to, to talk about density and uh, uh, local material because this gives us a new opportunity to, to rethink architecture in that way, I think. This is really important, and the ETH we also uh, collaborate with Gramazio Colo, we collaborate with Arno Schlüter Building Physics, um, integrated building system to, to to talk about processes which are very really complex. So we also believe it's an interdisciplinary 
um, uh, strategy that the, it's not that the architect has one big idea and then he draws his project and then he starts to talk with engineers. No, it's from the beginning. Uh, this pretension idea didn't work uh, without the input from your concept, which was in our semester, which is a very important engineer uh, at the, uh, in, in Switzerland. He helps us to develop uh, this technique and it was a, a, a dialogue from the beginning. And maybe this is also something which has to change in architecture's mind that uh, we start to really talk with our colleagues, our engineers, because Klima, the aspect of Klima, you can't add at the end of a design, it's, it's completely part of the whole process. And I think this is in a way, uh, we have to do something for the Klima, but on the other hand, and it's uh, it's really um, it's important that we have to do. So you cannot see this is a heavy thing to do. But on the other hand, it's also an amazing chance for architecture to do something new, which was not possible 10, 20 years ago. And now I believe in, I can only speak for Switzerland and maybe for Europe, part of Europe. That it's, it's We have questions now from Berlin, from Austria to do. And also France is asking us for project. So it's now something happened, and I think it's a good time to, to, to do new things. And it's maybe more possible than uh, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I, I have a few questions here from, from our audience. They are mostly technical questions. Uh, so I will go here, start with Fabio. Uh, Fabio, how sh this, is, this is a question from Gabriela. Oh, no, this is not from Gabriela. Sorry, Gabriela just compiled them here. Uh, well, there is someone here asking how synchrony is, syn syn is affecting the final structural integrity in the clay rotunda. Would you consider the produced clay walls as load bearing? Uh, I will add some few more. Have you considered also firing, firing a similar structure, but maybe with smaller pallets and consequently thinner wall thickness? to get a sort of ceramic structure, especially for the frame areas like doors or windows? Yeah, I mean, the, the structure is still fragile. fragile. Uh, it was, uh, you know, laid out to carry uh, a roof uh, that, is, uh, that doesn't have uh, wind loads and, uh, and uh, snow uh, loads and things like this, but still it's, uh, it's load bearing carries its own weight and then a roof that is not, uh, it was not visible now in the, this was just uh, the, the outer shell. Now there is a, an interior construction and the roof on top. Uh, but uh, to fire it would mean uh, to a certain uh, extent to, you know, in, in invest input energy and then to lose this uh, capability ability to just do quick repairs. And uh, given that it's uh, a structure that is not exposed, I mean, I'm, I'm now talking about this particular project, you know, maybe within another context, uh, the answer would be different. But uh, given the fact that it's not exposed to rain, uh, we think it's perfectly fine to have this, uh, you know, fragile and, uh, and very, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, yeah, fragile structure because uh, you know you can scratch on it and uh, like take away material if you want, but it's fine. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, there are some few questions here to Roger. Uh, Roger, how does ramped earth wall behaves in the temperature climate due its term due it due to its thermal mass effect? Is it suitable for housing without insulation? And another question, what is the water content of the earth? Uh, and the third one, does Switzerland has a specific SIA for using remnant earth? So there was uh, not, we had an SEO rules, but now it's, that doesn't exist anymore. So they, they have to read them, but there's nothing anymore. There's not much research about earth construction so this is and the, the many more numbers are really missing so what we did we in this PC book we select all the numbers we know and we also ask our colleagues there's not there are a lot 
a lot of numbers, but then not all from us. Um, the the first question was about uh, the the uh, isolation, the insulation. Yes, it's yeah. about the thermal. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. If it's it's uh, for in our climate zone, uh, if you don't want to use uh, as insulation in the house, rack, we did uh, sixty centimeters construction, and we did. 12 uh, centimeters of inside insulation in straw because was the earth wall was not enough. Uh, if you build 1.5 meter, uh, then it's uh, you have enough isolation insulation uh, to don't do anything more. And there also uh, we we are try to do some research about uh, that we mixture we kind of mixture in the, that we put some. Uh, um, uh, yeah, some um, uh, lecker in the dishes or uh, misopore, some element which bring the isolant into the earth construction. But if you compress that, mostly you destroy the insulation. So this is uh, still a research with, which we should do. There is a new technique which comes out from DGH also the liquid loam technique and these techniques may be also allowed to put insulation into the mixture so there is uh, still uh, a lot of fulfill a lot of uh, research to do martin rauch developed a kind of double uh, construct double wall system for the all natura building he ran uh, also uh, he has a Concrete uh, um, uh, construction outside and inside. In between, he has an insulation. So maybe you can Google that. So there is uh, some research to do because 1.50 it's a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, it's too heavy. It's beautiful, of course, but on the other hand, we need also the space. Uh, so there is uh, there are some questions about that. Uh, some research to do about this insulation problem with earth. Uh, I think in, in Morocco and other climate zones, it's it's better, it's easier. Maybe there, there you don't need uh, insulation because it's in general warmer and it's more a cooling program. But yeah, it depends where you are. And the last thing I was... Uh, was called the there. Yeah. Uh, if, the, uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't understand this question. In fact, do you understand? Yeah, it? it's, uh, you, you have uh, a certain amount of water in it. And you have to bring the water out, uh, so it also depends about the mixture. So there, I have uh, I can't say you at the exactly number right now, but we have everything in our book. So, <laughs> have to, <laughs> yeah. So, so to to finish, there is a question for both, which I think it's quite interesting. Which is, do these other forms, do these sorry, do these forms were also built with other types of clay, having variations in their composition? And if they can carry some kind of mechanical property study to adjust the parametric model that describes the form. Uh, so I'm not sure if I, the first part so of the question was. Basically, the, the first part is if, if you have tried different kinds of clay. And, and the second part is about if the, if, if you do, if the parametric model is able to adapt to different kinds of clay and how it affects form. Mm, no, we, I mean, in our case, the, the clay has been engineered to a specific, uh, you know, towards a specific target that was uh, mainly to shrink as little as possible, you know, because it's not uh, rammed, uh, it's just deposited and being so, so thin, the whole construction gets very brittle. You know, we could not afford too many big cracks. Uh, but uh, the second part of the question, yes, uh, and not too particular now mix that we did not develop, but uh, the, the shape we choose uh, was like this on one hand for you know, macro reasons to give it stability. Uh, so the undulation at the base, but the second uh, uh, advantage of this uh, undulated uh, circle was that uh, it allowed for uh, movement. Now there is, uh, because this process is not, is not fast. It's not like concrete that you pour it and then, uh, you know, 10 hours later you take away the, 
the, the formwork and uh, 28 days later you have the full strength there it takes uh -huh. 28 days at least to get you know the water out and you know all the you know this phase in between basically the structure is not stiff you know, and moves so part of the, at least in our case, when, when you go for this extreme, you know, height uh, to width ratio, slenderness, then a lot of uh, the design uh, challenge is to keep it stable in uh, between the point of, uh, of assembly. So when you take the wet part and put it there until it's stiff, because at a certain point it will be completely stiff. But in between, it's malleable. And this and actually it can collapse very slowly, and it does. You know, there, you don't have. Uh, this is also why there is a big need to measure it on a continuous mm -hmm. uh, base in order to understand: does it move the way the engineers and the designer wanted it or expected to move, or not? Is there need for some um, specific measure of, uh, you know, to sustain it? But if it goes into the right direction, true form, you know, you can counteract this. The same with the crack, you know, if you have a, a perfect circle, you know, it cannot uh, become uh, small, get smaller. Now, if you have a curve that undulates, it's like a spring. Now, if there is the need to, you know, to, to, you know, it shrinks by uh, three centimeters on a meter. This is no problem because it's geometry to some extent, you know, that, that, that bends, you know? uh, the curve changes and uh, the force on the, you know, on the crack is, uh, is uh, smaller. These are very interesting, crazy complex relationship between design and form engineering and construction technique and material at the end. And to be honest, we, this was just a intuition, you know, a very, this does have, hasn't been calculated, you know, this, this research to eventually develop tools that would allow to anticipate these things to a greater extent. Uh, this is uh, just at the beginning. We have a research project, a PhD student uh, right now starting on uh, actually on, on this on this building technique looking at these specific problems maybe in three years we'll know more very interesting and, and, and roger what about the different compositions and different kinds of clay and yeah yeah, this is, uh, of course, they always, in, in the ram and construction, if you take the material from the side, it's, it's always different. So, and it's, uh, it's also, um, there is not much knowledge about. So you, mm -hmm. you take the earth out, you try to find the right mixture, and then you do some um, blocks, which you, uh, several blocks, and then you try to find out in an empiric way, which blocks are the right mixture, but you put that on the pressure and you measure them. And so you find out uh, how the right mixture is from, from, the, from the specific side. So uh, there is not one or two or three uh, mixtures. There are hundreds of which every side has a kind of other mixture. And uh, this is uh, also a problem because it's not like cement that you have just one mixture and then you do it in every place, you do the same and then you bring it and you know all the numbers. It's always something new. And if you, you, you can produce that at one, uh, at one side, and, and, but then uh, on the other hand, if you bring it a thousand kilometers to, from Berlin to Zurich, then it's a problem because of the traffic you produce. And, and then you have, again, a lot of energy. So you have to deal with the, earth from uh, Berlin and you also have to deal with the uh, earth from Zurich and you have to deal with the earth from Rio and it's always different. So this is uh, also research which is Kiyomaba at ETH start to how we can, how we are able to, to, to deal with all these different mixtures and this is uh, also something which 
doesn't make it easier to, to have uh, right, always the right numbers to, for the engineers to calculate because every site is different. So in a way, every country or every city has to uh, develop his own number and still the same city. It's not the same earth, it's changing all the time. So this is a big challenge also for earth <laughs> construction. So Swiss Next is, is asking me to make you three last questions. Uh, the first two are to Fabio. Uh, the first is how much more does it really cost? How much more does it really cost to build with this technology versus a conventional technology? And how many years do you think it will take for these robots to become massive and in turn, this type of constructions to become more democratic? And the other question also to Fabio is, how the project fits in the master program at ETH and do students contribute to the project? The whole series of questions. I, I, I mean, let's start from the last one. This is simple. Uh, we, have, uh, we have been developing research uh, to a very large extent uh, while teaching, so with students since the very beginning. Uh, the, we have PhD students that do very dedicated specific investigation uh, while writing a thesis, but normally teaching our Master of Advanced Studies and, uh, and so on, but also other classes we, we teach in the Master, uh, uh, integrate students of the design process uh, into research. And we have uh, you know, um, produced very nice results you could say this is a unprofessional researcher because they haven't been trained as researchers so far, but uh, architects and designers are very curious about things and uh, normally come up with solutions uh, that uh, in classical engineering terms, you wouldn't think of. Uh, maybe because they're a bit too far away or a bit too counterintuitive or, you know, uh, to un unplausible at first sight. This is uh, the last question, and now I forgot the second. The, the, <laughs> the, the other one was, I mean, how long do you think? Uh, ah, the uh, price and the, the, time, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very difficult, it's, I don't make any, I mean, the, the, the costing is, uh, uh, is, is very simple, it just depends on the success of things, you know. If you do a prototype, it costs 10 times more uh, than uh, the conventional, but not because the conventional is, is intrinsically cheap, but just because, you know, think of concrete. Concrete is a uh, crazy material. You get it almost for free. This is the, the reason why, you know, we build everything with way too much concrete because it's cheap, you know? And this relationship between, for example, material cost and labor have, have switched in the last 80 years, at least in Europe, you know, dramatically. If you think at works uh, from the 50s, uh, for many architects and engineers, uh, one among them, Nervi, you know, uh, they, they didn't make sense, uh, you know, 30 years after they have built them, because they have built them in a, in a context you know, after World War II, materials were super expensive and labor was almost for free. And after the, the economical miracle, you know, in the 70s, starting in the 70s, material had become for free and labor has become rare and expensive. So suddenly this sophisticated, uh, complex, fragile, uh, geometrical, uh, you know, structures that were indeed, you know, motivated by saving material became you know, the expression of luxury, you know, because they were 10 times more complex, uh, expensive than, than they used to be. And as we have seen today, probably now this relationship for whatever methodologies, uh, maybe, uh, you know, carbon taxes or, or other, you know, uh, ways to give the material the true uh, price, you know, will we'll revert or correct this uh, relationship again. But it's very hard to say when and how, and this is an intrinsically social and political uh, decision and question behind. And as for the robot, 
this is a pretty clear uh, sensing. Uh, it's uh, making enormous progress. Uh, uh, sensor getting cheap and it's all about sensors, you know, because the machines we have, they are already a standard and mass products, what they need to be to become very efficient and, uh, you know, reliable is uh, sensors. But this, is, but, this is the, but this is on track, but this, this question about the machine would, you know, this is a very long, long discussion yeah. because then we should discuss about the human in the loop, you know, about the social issue. Uh, our our program is not you know we like this machine. Sometimes we use it in a in a bit uh, hilarious ironic way you know when it throws stuff, but it's not a dogma you know I I can also very I very well imagine humans in another context to build such a structure if it makes sense you know it doesn't have to be a robot. And I think it's very important to add. the first the first part part of your answer was I think was very. Uh, very well, very, very well uh, uh, positioned. I mean, industry changes, right? And different circumstances and demands happen. I, I think we should keep that in mind. I think Roger, do, do you have a comment? No, it uh, was a perfect comment from Fabio <laughs> for the end of the conversation. If it's the end, yeah. No, I have no other comment. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, would, I would like to thank to you both. I think it was very, very interesting and instructive. And I will pass the word to Jason that we'll talk about the next webinars. Thank Thanks, you. Pedro. Thank you all. Uh, was very interesting, insightful. I just would like to, uh, first of all, share actually a picture of our pavilion in Rio. So this is it. This is uh, the insight um, part of uh, pavilion you see at the back actually both projects on the left the kiln tower and on the right the uh, robotic clay rotunda and at the back you see um, formerly the tallest most tallest building in Rio at the Plaza Mawa the Mawa square in the center of Rio I only quickly would like to um, announce that we have three other webinars remaining. So um, there is web webinar number two on September 29th about, again, earth, clay and context with uh, Martin Rauch from Austria, um, who also works uh, closely together with Roger Goldshauser and Fernando Mirto. He's a professor at the Federal University in Rio who works like also for a long time with uh, clay. Uh, moderation is with Igor Giebeciemi, um, also uh, from Brazil. Then this, the third webinar is on Wednesday, October 6th, about, uh, we would say, on digital fabrication in architecture with Fabian Scheuer from Switzerland and Benjamin Dillenburger from the Netherlands. And moderation will be Joe Jacobs uh, from the AIA, the um, American Institute of Architects, uh, yeah, from the US. Then the last one is uh, on October 13th or 14th, is not confirmed which day, um, but it will be with Jose Ferrando uh, from Spain, Marcos Acayaba, um, Brazil, Marcelo Aflalo, also from Brazil, and Moderation from World Architects, probably Renato Turi or somebody else from uh, World Architects. Um, this information you find on our website, insidearchitecture.com. Um, the information also about the pavilion and more photos of the pavilion, including uh, texts about the project, etc., is also on the website. You find it under events. So thank you, everybody. And I wish you um, a nice afternoon in Brazil and a good night in Europe. So hopefully see you soon. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>